Good morning to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. It is Thursday, the 20th of May, 2021, and as you can tell from the title card there, we do have an area of interest to the east of Bermuda that we need to talk about. Also, just a little minor area of discussion, worthy of discussion in the eastern Pacific. And then at the end of the video today, I'm going to show you some neat stuff from a weather balloon test that we did yesterday. My friend Brent coming up from the Virgin Islands, not only a friend, but he's also one of the supporters through our crowdfunding effort of this whole project. And he has been joining me all week to do some testing, severe weather, observation, photography, testing of equipment, vehicle cam testing. And yesterday, our weather balloon, our Herbie project, hurricane research balloon, very successful yesterday. And I'll show you that as a little treat at the end. But first, there's this invest area 90L out here to the east of Bermuda and basically the bottom line with this it is forecast to gradually take on more subtropical characteristics the wind is going to be spread out over a larger area it's not quite as concentrated as a classic tropical storm it's got somewhat of a warm core that it's going to, going to develop um, there's a lot of cold air in it right now and it has to kind of mix that out separate itself from the parent low pressure system and trough that created it. It's a very complex process, but it should develop some shallow convection. It's just not coming. Here's one way to look at it. It's not originating way down here where the water temperatures are nice and warm and the air mass is juicy and then it makes its way north. This is your source region down here of a lot of energy. The energy up in the subtropics where this is located is more derived from, and as we can see on this, the satellite animation, these troughs here, these baroclinic processes, processes or processes, whatever. But sometimes the energy from that trough can lift out, leaving the low pressure area behind, and it can sort of become its own thing, if you will, over relatively warm water with enough cold air still aloft that it creates a lot of instability, you get thunderstorms that are not quite as deep into the atmosphere as you would see over the tropics, but enough so that it could develop more characteristics resembling a subtropical storm, and thus it could get a name because we, uh, the National Hurricane Center keeps track of all of that. It's important. Mariners, um, any kind of uh, transatlantic flights, they have to know about these things. And of course, our friends in Bermuda. And this will generate waves. It's a huge weather system. And the waves are going to come out uh, impacting Bermuda, the Atlantic Canada, to the east coast of the U.S. So it's not a symptom of global warming or climate change. It's not a symptom that we're going to have a hyperactive hurricane season. We just have better tools now with high-resolution satellites and people like Jack Sillen who can interpret really incredible data that's out there that helps these things go detected. So don't read into it that, oh, they're just trying to name anything they want to because of an agenda. Not everything is an agenda. Trust me, the tools are better. And so we can see these things, analyze them. And because they're out over the ocean and they take on subtropical characteristics, yes, they do get a name and that's worthy uh, of doing so because they do have impacts. So here's what Jack's talking about. Very similar to what we're discussing here, discussing here is that in the subtropics this morning, meaning that it's not down in the deep tropics, we do have this area of low pressure east of Bermuda, and it's increasingly likely to become our first subtropical cyclone of the season over the next few days. And this is an interesting diagram, the phase diagram chart. Kind of follow along here. This is where it is now, and it's asymmetrical. Oh, look, you can't even see because I have the same color blue. There we go. It's asymmetrical cold core now, headed towards more symmetrical warm core. And this is all automatic uh, tracking and analysis from computer models, understanding the thermal wind profile, the core of it, etc. And then it transitions back to asymmetric warm core, and then finally over towards being cold core once again. That's the life cycle of it. And you can see where it's forecast to be on the maps over here, eventually lifting out into the North Atlantic. What does all of this mean? It means it's complicated, that it'll eventually get more warm core with more thunderstorms developing near its center. 
And for Bermuda, that could mean some heavy rain, some gusty winds. And um, actually, I was seeing some talk from one of our supporters there, Howard, that Bermuda has seen plenty of rain recently. So my notion that this could be beneficial, evidently Bermuda is well and good on the rainfall. So maybe we won't root for this to bring fresh water to Howard and the rest of the residents of Bermuda. Maybe it would be problematic. That's good, though. You don't want to be in a drought, and you also don't, don't want to be flooded either. But this will be something to watch over the next few days. Here's another um, representation and analysis of it from Jack, that the satellite imagery shows this complex double-barreled storm northeast of Bermuda. You've got uh, one center and gale area of thunderstorms here, and then another area of cold air aloft over there. And it's just got to try to separate itself out and become one singular low pressure area and maybe at that point it can become organized enough to deserve a name and this is what some of the diagram or the modeling shows uh, here from the H wharf for 90L kind of get an idea of it and finally the wave action from it this is important some of those waves the energy as we see here from the GFS significant wave height Yes, some of those waves could head towards the East Coast, up towards the Canadian Maritimes, and the weekend coming up, people going to the beach, it's going to be hot, especially in the Southeast. This is something you need to pay attention to. You understand? This is why we keep up with this. It's not always about your Category 3, 4, and 5 hurricanes that gets millions of views on television, on social media. Sometimes it's these sort of hybrid systems that send waves and rip current conditions that could affect your family when you go to the beach. That's why you have to pay attention to everything. All right? All right, so there you go. That's that. Uh, let's look at it real quick on the GFS. And Jack's right. It is an interesting sort of double-barreled system. Pocket of energy over on the west, another pocket of energy and vorticity over on the east side, within a larger envelope of cyclonic energy and you know just overall troughiness that's still kind of stuck out there in the Atlantic east of this big old high pressure area and near Bermuda. Now watch what happens over the next couple of days as I put this into motion frame by frame. It finally sort of congeals right there. That's what we look for. That little guy right there. That little vorticity maximum. Easy to spot. Still broad wind field overall the pressure gradient spread out there's the high pressure over the eastern u.s that will keep it from diving on southwest towards the coast instead as you will see it will eventually lift out with time and head on out into the atlantic there it goes off off it goes that's it bye bye so not a big deal not anything to again worry about it's not a sign of anything bad it's just the weather, and sometimes the weather is just the weather, and that's why we keep an eye on this kind of stuff. But real serious here, if you're headed for the beach this weekend, or if you're in Bermuda, they have beaches there too, be mindful of the, the high surf, the potential for rip currents, and keep yourselves safe. And that goes for you surfers. It might have been a while since you've been in the water. Maybe this is your first time surfing. Be careful out there. Heed the advice of the local lifeguards and beach patrol folks they want to keep you alive just like I do because without you there's no reason for me to do these videos right there you go all right real quick for uh, severe weather purposes this is the convective outlook for today things are calming down over here where it's desperately needed for things to calm down it's been rather wet and very disastrous not only from the rain but from the hailstorms I mean it has been a very damaging month uh, really from mid-April until now, from hail to flooding, lots of claims adjusters out there, very busy, I am sure. So today's focus for limited severe weather will be up here in the high plains. Not much of a tornado threat at all. You can't rule out a brief tornado, certainly. But the main issue will be wind, uh, if I can get it to show up there, the mouse over. And, you know, some, some gusty winds and the potential for some large hail. Really not widespread, probably very picturesque if you get out there and, and check it out. If you live near there or you're heading out there yourselves, tomorrow, less of a risk, generally the same area, 
And then finally, by Saturday into the weekend, more energy ejecting out of the desert southwest here. A little bit of a dry line set up, perhaps. Thunderstorms coming out of New Mexico and into Texas. This may get upgraded to a marginal, I'm sorry, a slight risk. It wouldn't surprise me. I will be home by then as I fly home tomorrow and tomorrow night. Uh, so here, I want to show you this real quick. This is from yesterday. As I said, Brent and I have been out here for the last several days. I got here Saturday, and we've been doing all kinds of testing of equipment, severe weather documentation, you name it. And one of the things that we did is test this new weather balloon design payload that Brent came up with, uh, kind of a triangle. And um, I should have had a picture of it on here. My apologies. You know what? Let me go look and show you on Twitter real quick. That's fine. Um, let's see. We'll do... I think he's Mr. Typhoon. Yes, that's Brent's handle, Mr. Typhoon. There it is. That's a picture of what it looks like, sort of going to the end here. The spoiler, that's him recovering the payload. It's made out of carbon fiber, and it's got a triangle shape. It's much lighter, two pounds, and it can house a couple of GoPro cameras, the other weather sensors, and it is hoisted into the atmosphere via weather balloon. And that's what I want to show you a couple of highlights from real quick. This is the prep and the launch. Let's turn the volume down. There's me getting it ready. There's the GoPro view on the road. Brent gets over there, picks it up. I'm just going to kind of scroll through here. He's going to let it go. It's pretty cool. I was trying to get everything ready. I wanted to film him. And he's like, I'm ready to go. So here it goes. So this thing rises optimally about 800 to 900 feet per minute. This is the uh, Texas countryside out near Vernon, Texas. Then, as we go up into the atmosphere, we'll kind of move through these fairly quickly, um, it gets really interesting. You can see the cloud cover all across. Now we're over Oklahoma, and we're probably up around 32,000 feet or so. And it's very steady, this design that he came up with much more steady than the Pelican case that I've been using, but the Pelican case protected all of the equipment. We have to figure out some things. We've got the stability that we want, but now we have to have better protection of the equipment. Um, let's go a little bit higher now, all up into the stratosphere. This is probably 70, 75,000 feet up, well above all commercial airspace, and in case you're wondering, Yes, you do have to file a NOTAM or a notice to airmen, uh, and we do that through flight services, and that alerts air traffic that there may be a weather balloon crossing through airspace, typically between zero and 60,000 feet. Above 60,000 feet, there is no commercial air traffic, just military and UFOs. <laughs> just kidding. So the balloon keeps rising. We got up to about 90,000 feet. Look how steady that is. We're in the thermosphere now, and the temperatures actually rise at this point of the atmosphere after dipping into the uh, minus 30 Fahrenheit. Temperatures get back up close to um, freezing, actually close to zero Celsius. We actually got to about minus 3 Celsius for our high temperature in the thermosphere. The balloon goes on up. It reaches what we call burst altitude. And yesterday that was at about 90,000 feet. Look at that. Just incredible. We want to do this in the eye of a hurricane one day. That's the goal. There we go. The balloon uh, finally reaches burst altitude. Backing it up so I can show you that happening. There we are. So the balloon reaches an area where the pressure is so low that the balloon expands and pops right there. And it begins its descent back to Earth. Now at this point, there's hardly any atmosphere. And so the parachute can't catch. And so it's quite a wild ride down, as you can see. Looks a lot like it's out of control. But watch what happens once we get into the atmosphere. 17 minutes into the future. There we go. Once we get into the atmosphere, the parachute is able to feel the thicker uh, atmosphere. And it levels out a lot better. Gets closer and closer to the ground. And here we are coming in. Whoops. Sorry jumped ahead <laughs> there we go here we are coming into a nice wheat field 
and it's just a slow descent, no problem. Bam, comes in, sends a beacon out over what we call APRS, and lo and behold, Brent and I show up sometime later. Let's see here, try to find it. It's really funny, we finally come across it. Using a radio beacon called APRS, we have to get to, there we are, we have to get within about a mile of it. There's Brent. Took us about an hour or so. GoPro ran for five hours, 11 minutes till the time we caught up with it there. And a very successful and happy, there's happy Brent, a successful launch of Herbie Jr. as we call it. Um, and it may just become the Herbie payload. We're going to work on some things. In fact, we're testing it again today. It's our last test, our third one. We tested it day before yesterday, but the GoPro failed on that one. We tried some different things yesterday, and it was perfect. Ran for over five and a half hours. So that's what we were doing yesterday. Today we will be launching it again, and this time we're going to put a 360-degree GoPro Max camera on there with the regular Hero 4 to try to double up our video and provide some really unique 360-degree virtual reality video, so stay tuned for that. All of this, by the way, is supported through our crowdfunding effort, Patreon, and if you're interested in helping out and want to become involved with it, uh, patreon.com slash hurricane track is how you do so, and the link to that is in the description of all of these videos. All right, well, that is it for me for today. i got to finish this, put it online, and get out there and test that weather balloon again today. Uh, we're actually launching west of El Reno, and it'll head up into Kansas from there because the winds up in the atmosphere at about 30,000 feet are very strong out of the south. So we figure it's going to drift about 100 miles north. Um, so somewhere between Lawton and El Reno is where we will launch today. And stay tuned. I'll tell you how it all turned out later. All right, have a good rest of your Thursday. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. I am Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll chat with you again. If not tomorrow, then certainly over the weekend.